Thank you for joining us. And um, I guess the, I think back on July of 2016 when we hosted a three-day gathering here on strengthening the global refugee protection system. And the goal was to, at that point, to inform the UN sum Summit on Migrants and Refugees, which, as you know, was held in September of 2016. And we had a number of scholars, um, leading NGOs, UN officials with us during those days. And they wrote on different aspects of um, the global refugee protection system and how to strengthen it. And in fact, we have hard copies of that collection, which is, I think, about 500 pages long at this point in the back. So please take them when you go. So that, as you know, the summit led to the New York Declaration, which in turn led to the negotiations on the global compacts on migration and on refugees. And today we're going to speak on the compacts, but particularly about the refugee compact. And we'll also raise, we'll also look at those from the perspective of some of the articles and the ideas that were fleshed out in those articles and do they adhere to those ideas. So Kevin Appleby, our Director of Policy, has been covering the compact negotiations for us. He's just back from a week in Geneva. Um, I'm going to leave it to him to introduce the panelists, but I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who's Andrew Painter to my left here, and he's a Senior Protection Officer at UNHCR here in New York. Andrew is going to get us started by providing an overview of the Global Compact on Refugees. And he may also speak on some of the opportunities that still exist um, to provide input into that document and some of the potential issues or actual issues of overlap between the Migration Compact and the Refugee Compact. We've known of Andrew and Andrew's good work for many, many years now. He was. Uh, he was in D.C. for nine years, so we knew him from there, and he's really a, he's an expert on all of the issues that we really care about. Detention of asylum seekers, unaccompanied minors, barriers to access to protection for refugees and the like. And recently, he's been the head of protection and human rights for UNHCR's New York office. So, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say and how you're going to clarify this very complicated process for all of us. <laughs> Are we up there? Yes. Or, or wherever you want to go. Wherever you want to go. Okay. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to CMS for inviting, for inviting you UNHCR, for inviting me. Um, it's always good to have the opportunity to talk about the, the Global Compact on Refugees here in New York. Where Everybody just seems to want to talk about the global compact on migration. Um, no surprises. What I thought I would do, I was asked to sort of give an overview on the GCR, and I thought I would hit three basic issues. One is, what does the, the global compact on refugees seek to achieve? Um, second of all, what are its main elements? And then third, um, as Don alluded to a bit on the, the issue of coherence and complementarity between the GCR and, and the GCM. So what does the, the Refugee Compact seek to achieve? And I, I think here it is important to go back in time to September of 2016, looking at Bella, because Bella and I spent a lot of time on the New York Declaration, um, which really was a major achievement in the area of refugee protection and in the area of the rights of migrants, we had, where we had 193 states at the highest levels, heads of state, in what I would describe as a pretty toxic environment. Uh, for refugees and migrants. Not that it's necessarily got a lot better, but it was particularly bad at that time. Um, where we had commitments made, there was a, they declared solidarity with people who are forced to flee. They reaffirmed the importance of the refugee protection regime. Importantly, they acknowledged um, that the protection of refugees and assistance to refugees provided by refugee hosting states was a shared responsibility of the international community which is a concept that has been disputed uh, in the past, um, but that made it in there, and not after some uh, work in terms of language. There is a commitment to expand solutions uh, for those who are displaced, and importantly, there is the establishment of a comprehensive and predictable refugee response mechanism. It's called the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, the CRRF, which uh, many of you might have heard of, which was Annex 1 to the New York Declaration, which has since been launched in, uh, I think it's now 14 countries and in two regions. And then there are a number of very specific commitments made to refugees, to migrants, and to refugees and migrants. 
So that was two years ago, and it launched, in the first instance, it launched the application of the CRRF, um, which is now well underway. And then, of course, it launched the, the, the processes for the GCM and the GCR. The Global Compact on Refugees fundamentally is about operationalizing the commitments that were in the New York Declaration. Look at what is needed to make those commitments a reality. Draw from the lessons learned from the CRRF, and that's actually in the New York Declaration. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, but also look at some other good practices. And then establish the mechanisms, the forums, to help make those commitments a reality. The GCR is not intended, though, to be a normative document. Um, the international refugee regime, as, as most of you know, it's, we have decades of experience, we have decades of standard building, we have a very firm legal foundation, we have a very firm normative foundation. And the GCR is really intended to, to build on that. Um, it's not intended to replicate it, it's not intended to replace it, and importantly, it's not intended to put some of those really important standards out there to be potentially renegotiated. Um, and it's not, by any means, the final word on all things refugee um, overall. It is fundamentally about responsibility sharing and burden sharing, uh, which is considered by many to be the biggest gap that we have had in the international refugee protection regime for 70 years. Uh, with the 1951 convention deals with the rights of refugees, it deals with the obligations of states, but it doesn't deal in any detail with this concept. It mentions in the preamble the concept of international cooperation uh, and the impact of hosting asylum seekers and states, but it does, there's no meat on those bones. What does that mean? And this uh, refugee compact is really an effort to fill that in a world today where if we look around, we see the extent of member state engagement on, on refugee situations. We know that receiving states have the biggest burden. We know that some 85% of all refugees live in the developing world. We know that 60% of all refugees live in 10 countries, all of them in the global south. We also know that there's a very small number of resettlement countries, a very small number of significant donor countries, at least to UNHCR. So the pool of member states certainly is relatively small out of the 193 that we have in our, in our playing deck. So the, the Global Compact on Refugees is fundamentally intended to bring those other actors in, in a predictable way, but also to bring in other actors in a more systematic and a predictable way, a multi-stakeholder approach and that means, very importantly, development actors, private sector, certainly refugees and host communities themselves, NGO civil society, academics. So that, I would say, overall is the vision in many respects of the Refugee Compact, with its objectives set out um, in, in, the, in the CRRF. The structure of the GCR itself, just quickly, there's basically four parts to it. The first part is an introduction that sets out the vision, the objectives. The second part is the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, the CRRF, which is included by reference. Purposefully, all you'll see right now is just the line with a link, because we very much want to avoid any impetus, any inclination to renegotiate um, the CRRF that was adopted by the New York Declaration. And then the program of action, and that's really the meat of it, in terms of the new text that's coming in. And there are basically two parts to that. One is mechanisms for responsibility sharing and burden sharing. And the second is areas in need of support. And I'll, and I'll talk about each one of those. And finally, there's an area on, on follow-up and review. So the first point is, is the responsibility sharing mechanisms. How do we, and that's the big question, how do we ensure meaningful responsibility sharing? And what the Global Compact on Refugees tries to do is to set up mechanisms. Uh, to facilitate that kind of a sharing to take place. Um, to address the need of host states who want to know, listen, if I have a major refugee in flux, do I have any sense of guarantee or any sense of anything that the international community is actually going to step up and support our country and our, and, and our host communities when, when that influx occurs? I need, as a host state, a predictable mechanism. Ideally, one that has some accountability attached to it as well, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
for responsibility sharing. So what the GCR right now, and I should say the third draft of the GCR was just issued on Monday. Um, so it's been coming out, uh, we had the 0, 1, 2, this is the fourth version of it. Um, it foresees these mechanisms on three levels. The first one is a global refugee forum with the idea that this would be a high-level forum eventually to meet every four years, um, ministerial level, so political, uh, with, which would give us the opportunity to highlight really the pressing needs, keep displacement on the international agenda. I think for those of us in the refugee field, the migration field, these past few years have been a little bit head spinning in terms of the actual attention that refugee movements get and migration movements get um, here at the UN. Broaden the base of support and then take stock of the implementation on implementation of the Global Compact. That's at the global level. The work is going to happen at the national level, uh, and that's uh, envisioned in the concept of national arrangements. We're already seeing that. Of course, the work always, has always happened at the national level. But if you look at some of the CRF countries, we see a, a shifting in the way that we're approaching it. We have seen, for example, in terms of government ownership, the one central aid, like the Office of the Prime Minister, now has taken control of the refugee response, bringing in all of the relevant line ministries, which is a bit different than the way it sometimes happens, where you're just talking to the refugee ministry. <coughs> and it brings in the development actors, and it brings in the other actors. So, and the idea that it's this crowd that would complete and draft and develop a comprehensive plan to respond to the, to the refugee influx, identifying as well what resources are needed uh, to make that happen, and linking that response to the other plans that are in the country, most importantly, or certainly relevantly, the development planning that's happening in the country. The third element on this, then, is what's called the support platforms. Uh, and these are more international in nature, but with the idea that they would very much support the national arrangements. And these would be situation-specific, as opposed to the global uh, refugee uh, forum, which is, uh, which is not. With a core group of member states that are relevant and other stakeholders, um, looking at that situation and looking at the kind of support that's needed, um, drawing from pledges that have made at other places, um, like the Global Refugee Forum, like a standby arrangement, there's the idea of that asylum capacity support group. Can we deploy that here? Can we deploy that there? Um, it would not be a standing forum, um, and it would eventually um, close up shop when, it's, uh, when the requesting state uh, thinks it's, it's time. Also tied into that is solidarity summits, where you could have sort of like a pledging conference, but looking for more things than just money, and looking for one specific situation. So that's broadly the architecture that you find in the Global Compact today. I mean, who knows where it will be in a month, but that's basically been the structure, uh, and I don't expect it to change a lot. The member state reactions so far have been generally positive overall. Some skepticism, is it going to work, is it not going to work, some details. How frequently should it meet? But overall, I think um, it's been generally received well because I think there is a recognition that this is something that has been fundamentally missing in the way that we do business. So this might move us. It's not going to guarantee, again, responsibility sharing. But if you have the mechanisms there to bring the states together and the other actors together, you're one step much further along than you would otherwise. The second area is the areas that need of support, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically it, it's, it looks at the range of issues that are to be addressed in any refugee response. Um, reception arrangements, issues related to registration, education, health, gender. Um, and the idea is that under those responsibility mechanisms, states would be able to make pledges to respond to those areas. They could make pledges in other areas as well, but that, that's their, <laughs> an important menu. Some key aspects in here. One is the very strong emphasis on host communities. And this came out of the New York Declaration as well, which is we're not only looking at refugees, we're also looking at host communities. This has been, this has been part of the language for some time now, but I think since the New York Declaration, it's been really raised up a notch. And the host communities are right there with the refugees in terms of ensuring access to education, health services, um, et cetera and again, bringing in the development side along, alongside it. Other key aspects, the commitments that you find in that area 
are framed as commitments of support to the host communities. Again, it's not a normative document. We're not talking about the rights of women, children, people with disabilities. We're talking about how can states support refugee hosting states, refugee hosting communities to make those rights a reality. <coughs> And finally is the strong emphasis on the humanitarian development nexus. And this has been, I think, one of the biggest game changers in the past few years with the entry, for example, of the World Bank with some $2 billion now dedicated to uh, funding windows for refugee hosting countries. Um, and the flip side of that, which is states who want to ensure that while they certainly welcome development assistance, they want to make sure that this is not going to come out of their development kitty for their own nationals that they actually want additionality. They want to make sure that there's more development funding coming. And finally, follow up and review, um, which is a challenge because this is a document that's not legally binding, but the main vehicle for that is going to be the Global Refugee Forum, which I, which I mentioned before, um, as well as reporting that the High Commissioner has to do in his annual report. There, if some pe people have been following lately, there's issues about indicators, and we can talk about that later maybe. Um, but just to maybe go quickly to the issue of coherence. Do I have a couple minutes? Sure. Am I doing okay? Um, in terms of how the GCR and the GCM correspond, um, the New York Declaration, of course, gave rise to two compacts, each of them to be developed under separate processes, distinct processes. The GCM is really fundamentally a different, it's a different kind of beast than the GCR, as I really just explained it. Um, the GCM, there is no overarching international normative and governance regime for migration. There's a, there's a number of legal regimes that apply, human rights law, labor law, some there's an international treaty on migrant workers, but it's not the same as with refugee protection. And I think, um, for me at least, the GCM is really seeking to establish that kind of international regime from a rights perspective, from a governance perspective. In, in many respects, I think the GCM is a much harder lift than the refugee uh, convention because uh, a compact is where we are. Um, but despite the fact that these are different processes and they have different nature, we do need to ensure that there's coherence. The reality today is we have refugees and migrants moving together. We have, in many situations, we have mixed movements. And some of the issues that are addressed in both are of interest to both. So issues of reception conditions, for example, um, treatment of uh, survivors of, of violence. Um, we don't need to have matching language, but there, we have to make sure we don't have contradictions, at least. Certainly for UNHCR, there's been an ongoing dialogue with the co-facilitators of the GCM process, with the Office of the SRSG for International Migration, with IOM, and every time a new draft comes out on the other side, everybody's looking at it pretty quickly to make sure we are in sync with each other. And of course, importantly, there are member states who are, in principle, part of both processes. One issue that has come up is this question of a gap, is whether or not there's a protection gap. Um, are people with protection needs falling between two compacts? Um, and I would say certainly international human rights law applies to both groups. Um, both have been subject to, to terrible abuses and exploitation. Um, key elements of, a key element of human rights law and refugee law is the principle of non lawful law. It's not just a principle of, of refugee law. But I think for, for UNHCR, when we're looking at this, a key issue for us is when we're defining who falls outside the refugee regime, that we don't take an overly narrow view of what, who is in the refugee regime. Uh, and recognize that the 51 Convention is actually a very broad document. It is uh, it's a live document. It's included people fleeing persecution, <laughs> conflict, uh, armed conflict, violence from gangs, uh, even situations of uh, environmental degradation where there's a conflict element there. So it's important that we approach the GCR with a, a very broad um, view of uh, the international refugee definition to make sure that we don't restrict it. And, and the draft, the latest draft of the GCR tries to bring attention to the need to avoid a gap if it's there. We can talk about climate change later if that comes up, but maybe just to mention the quickly the last steps, the next steps, the last steps. Um, we are now in round five of the GCR consultations, um, and we're looking at draft three that was just issued um, next week. The last round is to take place uh, in July. There's been a very strong effort to keep New York uh, uh, member states' permanent missions um, here 
engaged and aware because it is ultimately going to come back to New York to be adopted. So um, we have been doing briefings usually from our Assistant High Commissioner for Protection, Boulder <coughs> Turk. He'll be doing another one after each round. So he'll be here on the 22nd of June uh, to give another briefing uh, to member states. And then ultimately the, the draft refugee compact will be included with the High Commissioner's report to the General Assembly. It's an annual report. will go in late July. And then he will present his report with the Global Compact in November with the hope that it is, inshallah, adopted by the GA in December uh, of this year. And there you go. That's the overview. Thank you. OK. So um, thanks, Andrew, for that overview. Very helpful. It sort of helps crystallize maybe some of the issues that we'll be talking about on the panel. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin Appleby. I'm the Senior Director for International Policy here at the Center. Um, and as has been mentioned by Don, this symposium is based on our collection entitled Strengthening the Global Refugee Protection System um, and using that framework to assess progress made on the protection of refugees, not only in the Global Compact on Refugees, which is our main topic today, but how that may bleed into the Global Compact on Migration. So, our panelists today, although they'll be focused on the Refugee Compact, there will be some discussion about how some of the issues, including certainly gaps in protection, may have to be covered or are being covered in the uh, Migration Compact. Um, if you notice from the collection, there are many topics that are covered that are talked about in the Global Compact on Refugees, including responsibility sharing. We have an article from Volker Turk himself on that. Um, emergency response, reintegration, national sovereignty and refugee protection, and uh, the protection of migrants in vulnerable situations, and the use of deterrence as a method to address large flows of migrants and refugees. And these, some of these issues will be discussed by our panel today. Uh, as Andrew Mission mentioned, there, there are issues which, from our perspective, are still sort of murky with both the Refugee Compact and, to some extent, the Migration Compact. First is, of course, the issue of complementarity and how they are coherent, which Andrew talked about. Um, some may think that they're not coherent enough and that there are gaps there in the protection regime uh, that need to be filled. And there has been some thought that the Global Compact on Refugees, for example, has been too narrow in its approach in terms of protection, and that a lot of pressure has been put on the Global Compact on, on Migration to sort of fill the gaps for those large number of migrants in vulnerable situations, such as those fleeing violence, climate change victims, and others, um, who may not be covered in the Global Compact on Refugees. And what we've seen in the, in the negotiations, and I haven't been at every, certainly, refugee negotiation because I've been in Geneva, but we've seen many member states dismiss certain language saying, oh, that'll be in the Global Compact on Refugees, or that'll be in the Global Compact on Migration. So they've sort of been, it's sort of been a bit of a ping pong going back and forth as to which compact is going to cover who um, and, and where that may be going. Um, Another issue, as I mentioned, is the existence of protection gaps. Um, but a big issue which is coming up now, and I, I think in both compacts, is the issue of implement, implementation mechanisms and accountability measures, especially in the Global Compact on Migration. But I think because both documents are legally not binding, they may be politically binding, but they're not legally binding. The issue of how implementation will happen, how accountability, will occur and what the objective measure for progress may be is still a little ill-defined um, and will probably be part of the main discussions certainly in the last round uh, uh, for both compacts. And the other sub-issue to that is how does civil society fit into that moving forward in terms of uh, reporting, in terms of accountability, uh, and in terms of implementation because civil society, is, of course, is a very <coughs> important, um, important actor in this. Uh, and I think there, there's a growing realization that these issues might not be completely solved by the end of the negotiations, that all of the 
T's will be crossed and the I's will be dotted, that it has to be an ongoing process as, as the compacts are implemented. And that will certainly place a lot of importance on the role of civil society in terms of urging their governments to implement uh, both compacts robustly. So some of those are some of the big issues at play, and, and our panelists are going to talk about that and, and maybe some of the more specific issues that are involved that um, still need some attention. So what I want to do is introduce our distinguished panelists and the order in which they will speak, and then they will, they will talk and then we'll have an open discussion, and we'll invite Andrew back up for that. Um, so our first speaker is Bella Hovey. Welcome, Bella. He's the Chief of the Migration Section of the Population Division of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And Bella has been closely following both compacts and he, of course, um, worked hard on the New York Declaration of, of, as well. So he'll be able to give us a good sense of, of the complementarity issues between both compacts. Uh, our second speaker will be Sernada Reynolds. Hi, Sernada. Uh, she's a policy director for global displacement and migration for Oxfam International. Um, she's also <coughs> worked for Refugees International as well. <laughs> um, she's one of the few advocates who has been closely monitoring and advocating and influencing both compacts. Uh, because not all of us can be in two places at one time or across an ocean to, to, to influence that. So sonata has been very involved in both. So she's going to talk about some of the areas in the Refugee Compact and necessarily the Migration Compact, which may need improvement and better coherence. Our third speaker is Don Kerwin, who really needs no introduction. He's the Executive Director of CMS and founder and editor of the Journal of Migration and Human Security. Um, and he will look at the issue of national sovereignty, which is a huge sort of issue in both the negotiations and the, the tension between national sovereignty and multilateral cooperation and where they meet, um, and how, how um, you know, refugee protection policies can complement national sovereignty and national security. And last but not least, um, up from Washington this morning, Jennifer Podkohl is the policy director for Kids in Need of Defense. Um, kind is, is working all ends of the hours and the, uh, uh, these days because of some recent events in, in, the, in the U.S. in terms of uh, our border policies. So uh, she's coming from that battle to, 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 to talk to us today. So thank you for your time. And she's going to talk a little bit about some of the specific policies, policy issues which she thinks should be addressed in, in the compact. So with that introduction, I will say to Bella that you have the floor. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am uh, very happy to be here, thanks to CMS for uh, inviting uh, the UN and, and myself uh, to think about this. I don't have really uh, nicely polished remarks, but I just want to raise some issues and I think we're still very much in the brainstorming and exchange of issues and exchange of ideas kind of mode when it comes to developing both global compacts. So please take my... Uh, comments in that, uh, in that sense. Uh, I prepared a few slides that I want to use uh, and then I'll say a few words particularly from the New York Declaration perspective I think where I was closely involved together with Andrew and, and, and some of the others. <coughs> and so um, let me see I what is this? This is the wrong side. Uh, okay yeah okay so <coughs> Migrants and refugees, uh, Donald used the word in his introduction uh, to talk about overlap, and I like that. Uh, it's interesting to see that word uh, choice. You have the refugee compact and the migration compact, and both are supposed to be independently developed, and are being independently developed, as, as uh, Andrew was saying. Overlap suggests something that is as far as I'm, I'm not a Native American speaker, but it's something negative. We want to avoid overlap. I happen to, I use the other word actually, which I think is, a, which is, a, what, what did I use? Uh, supplement, uh, complementary, no, potential synergies. <laughs> so, you see, we're talking about the same thing, I think, but maybe I'm from a slightly different angle. <clears throat> um, okay, 
Now, as uh, Andrew was saying, we don't have a comprehensive migration protection, uh, micro protection uh, regime. <coughs> but just let me throw out there very clearly, we are evidence driven in, in New Odessa. Who is an international migrant? And then for statistical purposes, anyone who changes his or her country of residence, meaning you have to make a physical move, not part of that definition. That statisticians have agreed for decades around the world. <coughs> Not part of that definition is why they're moving or what the legal status is. And so how to measure it is basically the question on the foreign born or citizenship question. And I think you have some recent discussions here in the United States about that in the census. That's where we get the data from. So you're ready. Okay, so let me just quick, I don't need to tell you, of course, who is a refugee, but I did want to underline one of those uh, elements of the refugee definition of the 51 convention that it's someone who's outside his or her country of nationality. <clears throat> so, which also presupposes for most people a move across international borders. Now, okay. And, can, I, can you lower the projector a little bit because there is something, there's a header there, where's the projector? Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> we can lower it but then we can't put it back up. Okay, I was trying to uh, to show you a little bit the different narratives that are out there and, 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 and who is driven, driving what. So the title of this one actually is a good exercise. The red one are the refugees, so this is an exercise now. And the blue one are the international migrants. Okay, two uh, domains or universes if you want. Okay, now let me give you an example. I just come from a statistical perspective, as I mentioned, and, 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 and as I said, everyone who changes his country of residence or hers is a migrant. It doesn't mean for what reason, and the refugees are part of that, because most refugees cross an international border. Now, the size should be somewhat smaller, because we're talking about 10%, but that's the idea, right? Refugees are within the definition of statistics on an international migrant. Now. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think from a human rights perspective, it's the other way around. You have fundamental rights of everyone, including uh, migrants and citizens and what have you, and then you have kind of an additional layer of rights for refugees. But that's a kind of a bit of a different perspective. Now, now here's the exercise. <clears throat> where does this come from and where does this come from? So, anyone wants to take, wants to take at this? I think this is very much what the UN has now decided in terms of the development of both compacts. Independent, separate, I don't know, what other words do we have to make sure that they have nothing to do with each other? That's, that's, but don't quote me here for that. Just. <laughs> but basically that's what the resolution says about the development set in 71 to 88, I think. This one, I think, is very much the vision of the New York Declaration. Andrew hinted at it. Because very interestingly, I think, that text talks about <coughs> commitments for, it starts with commitments for both refugees and migrants, that applies to both. Then it talks about commitments that applies to migrants, and in other words, not to refugees. And then it talks about commitments for refugees, in other words, don't apply to migrants. However, if you read the preambular paragraph of that section, it says actually, and here it becomes even more uh, murkier, <clears throat> is that some of the commitments that are listed under refugees may also apply to migrants, and some of the commitments that are listed under migrants may also apply to the refugees. So, it's, for me it shows there are many different views on, but I just thought kind of to put this up to, to think about how different groups are, are looking at it. <coughs> now. If you then go to the New York Declaration, and I just wanted to highlight a few elements of that, and it may be useful because the previous speaker was highlighting mostly uh, issues from the refugee compact. You know, our paragraph six, which t talks about the treatment, is governed a uh, separately governed uh, refugees and migrants, separate legal frameworks. That was one of the paragraphs that took an enormous long time to negotiate, and, and you can still see that it's unsettled in the Global Compact for Migrants. You remember they proposed something and again there's a pushback to that. 
that idea, and again, it speaks, I think, to those different universes and, and where you're coming from. <clears throat> now, the, if you look at the commitments, according to the New York Declaration, that apply to both refugees and migrants, and there are 19 paragraphs on that, you know, it talks about reception, and it talks about special needs, and it talks about border controls, and it talks about collecting accurate information, it talks about uh, addressing unsafe movements of refugees, uh, the, mixed, the mixed flows, uh, movements of refugees and migrants, it talks about vulnerabilities of women and children. So there are m many of the issues are listed there, although, and even further down, it's about combating xenophobia, racism, discrimination. You remember there is the, uh, the campaign on uh, <coughs> that was uh, launched as part of the New York Declaration. Uh, integration, inclusion, improved data collection. One of the paragraphs, I think, or an issue that is missing really, I think it has to do in a greater, in, in terms of, it's more related to impacts, economic impacts, social impacts. Integration is there, but not so much the economic impacts or the impacts on development for that matter. So, I think, and if you then look at the uh, last draft of the refugee compact, again, you can see many of those issues coming back. Um, it's about the, uh, in paragraph 9, it's about the uh, uh, discrimination, exploitation, uh, and so anti-non-discrimination, <coughs> which is of course overarching. But in particular, I think, well, then there's an issue of the development and the humanitarian assistance and the overlap. Something that was very strong as well in the negotiations of the New York Declaration is to push that issue of, of, of host communities, as Andrew was mentioning. But in particular, I think, well, yeah, in particular, where we see a lot of similarities in language, I think, is, is uh, when it comes to the uh, issues such as uh, the support, the meeting needs and support of communities, uh, education, in, in inclusiveness of education, okay, it's for refugees, but obviously it goes also, applies also to other migrants. Jobs and livelihoods, employment, <coughs> labor market analysis, you know, that's language that goes straight into, that has a lot to do with, with other migrants, with migrants as well, or other migrants. Financial products even which made me think about remittances and all that issue, the economic impact of remittances, financial inclusion. It really doesn't matter whether you're sending back to uh, money to a family of refugees or a family of migrant workers, I think, in terms of the economic impact. Health issues, of course, we, we are very familiar. You know that the negotiations on the Global Compact are very much in terms of access to health and as well. So there again, if, if it is about access of refugees, well, but in the same vein, it's about access of all migrants, I would say. Now, even language on return and reintegration, livelihood opportunities, I think certainly states are talking about that when they talk about return of migrants. But it's kind of, you know, similar concept, I think, that refugee has been, that UNHCR has been using for a long time uh, to provide uh, assistance to those who are returning to make sure that returns are, are sustainable. <coughs> uh, so these are just a few issues I think that I wanted to point out which are, are highly similar. Do we need similar language on it? Not necessarily. I have a few more slides that I wanted to show you because uh, three or four more and at the end I will uh, I have a slide where I think we, we, we should think about how to go forward in making sure that that coherence, maybe that's the best word, uh, is, is, is uh, applied and maybe to a somewhat greater extent than during the negotiations when it is all purely informal. <coughs> now, okay, so I just wanted to, you know, I said I was coming from a numbers perspective. And just to get an idea that the refugees are a very small portion of the world population, about 0.3%, with somewhat higher percentages in, in developing countries, but also in Europe, by the way, the average is higher as compared to some of the other regions. If you look at uh, 
what is this? Oh, there's no title, but uh, this is the proportion of refugees in all migrants uh, estimated by us. And you can see at the world level, and this is uh, 3, 2000, 2010, 2017. So at the world level, it was about 8%, then it, it dropped to about 7%, and that's about 10%. So the share of refugees in all migrants is kind of increasing. But I think what is particularly striking after it, after it went down, what is particularly striking, I think, is that that issue of least developed countries and Africa and, and, and Asia, where that share of refugees uh, is, is quite high. <clears throat> now, this is the, uh, this is a, the same indicator, but on a country-by-country -country basis, the share of migrants, uh, refugees in all migrants, and dark colors meaning high proportions in Africa, Western Asia, not very surprising. <clears throat> But I think these types of indicators can also be used in terms of this burden sharing and responsibility sharing. And I think there is this one. When I was working with UNHCR a long time ago, we already thought about indicators of burden sharing. And one is you can think of the ratio of refugees to the global domestic product per capita. And here, dark colors mean a very uneven, a very high burden, meaning a lot of responsibility for those countries basically compares refugees to uh, wealth, if you want. And so it's just a simple one, but it shows how uneven the burden sharing is. And uh, I hope that some of that uh, academic, I think there's going to be an academic uh, group being established under the Refugee Compact. And I think there's really a need for academics and for research to see what are the indicators of burden sharing. Uh, you will never finish the discussion because uh, it's very difficult to agree on a precise definition. We've seen in the European Union there was a definition for burden sharing, but that was developed by the Commission and not accepted by all member states, so in terms of application. <clears throat> but clearly it helps us define where countries are doing more and where countries are doing less. Um, just another similarity, I think, between refugees and migrants. We know that most refugees are close to home and that is a very much of a geographical uh, law, if you want, because all migrants, if you look, most of the migrants in Africa, Oceania, Asia, and Europe are actually migrants from that same region. There is not a lot of transatlantic or transcontinental uh, movement, at least not, uh, except for on the left side, most of the Latin American migrants are in the north. Um, okay, this is the last slide, and this is what I wanted to mention. Potential synergies, I think, are, if you go through the documents, it's about drivers, it's about arrival reception, it's about integration, socioeconomic and legal. I think it's about impacts, it's about the measurement of the data issues, and certainly this is not a comprehensive list. Now, how does it work in terms of process? I think we need to look at, in terms of member state responsibility, what is happening in terms of implementation and follow up and review, and maybe you're familiar with those paragraphs in the Global Compact on Migration. <clears throat> There's a responsibility of the uh, UN entity, UN agencies, and uh, as you may know, the Secretary General has uh, decided that there will be an interagency network on migration. And so that network, I think, can also look at complementarities and making sure that, that actions are coordinated and concepts are, concepts are developed. I read something about the recognition of qualifications, for example, in the refugee compact. Well, you know, that doesn't apply to refugees only, it applies to foreign qualifications, full stop, whether it doesn't matter what your background is. Um, and of course the major groups, and I think that uh, talks to the issue that I think uh, was raised uh, just before. What is the role of civil society, the private sector? We call them major groups in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> Academia, local authorities, etc., etc. Again, many of those actors are mentioned in both compacts. Most, many of those actors are responsible or should contribute to the implementation of both compacts. And so that is where I think, uh, even if it's not written in the documents themselves, there are some ways of, of encouraging those synergies. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Kevin said, I have been <laughs> furiously trying to keep up with 
both global compacts and having the negotiations and the migration compact today or this week and then the global the newest version of the global compact and refugees also come out this week it's been um, pretty exciting so I wanted to start though by thanking the Center for Migration Studies for having me here in the panel today Donald and Kevin who do an amazing work uh, for my fellow panelists for UNHCR um, what I wanted to do was just cover a few, um, basically first, um, Oxfam's priorities for the refugee compact, um, and then specifically look at how uh, at women's rights, um, local leadership, refugees and migrants, how they're going to be incorporated into the different, the, both of the compacts, focusing on the refugee one. Then look at um, two issues of complementarity, one being uh, the principle of non reformo the other one being um, those displaced and migrating because of climate and disasters. And then finally, I just wanted to make a comment on the treatment of human rights in the refugee compact. So with that, um, so I mean, both of the compacts right now um, are, they could be worse, <laughs> start there. Um, and some of the most important provisions of the um, refugee compact are, are strong. Um, the, I think there's a lot on the principles or the, so the mechanism for responsibility sharing, for equitable and predictable responsibility sharing that are really important. Um, there's more concreteness around this than um, really I, th I think I've, I've ever seen. And I actually wrote a white paper on this for this compact. So I did a lot of research and then methodology. So I think what's coming out in that area is actually quite, um, there's a lot. There's a lot there and there's a lot to work with. That is one of the priorities for Oxfam, um, equitable and predictable responsibility sharing, women's rights and local leadership. Um, and on that piece, I wanted to just talk quickly about um, what, I, what I think is there and what still needs to get there. Um, obviously, women experience displacement and migration from a gendered perspective. I mean, it is gendered. The experience of displacement and migration is a gendered experience. Women, uh, the, the reasons for their flight is often specifically related to their gender, to gender discrimination, to persecution, to the mistreatment um, and the, uh, the unequal treatment of women and girls. But also in the transit and uh, country of destination, of course, they also experience gendered violence, uh, gendered um, you know, inability to access services in the way that men can because specifically of their gender. It really does need to be taken into account in a very meaningful and participatory way. Um, refugees and migrants, of course, are the greatest experts on their own experience, what they need. And so, of course, they should also be very much present. And as Andrew talked about, host communities or receiving communities in the case of migrants um, are also experts in what happens when a large movement of people enter into their communities. And they really need to be not just consulted, not just um, uh, given a nod, but actually completely and wholly uh, a part of any policy practice and implementation of either global compact. So on the refugee compact in particular, um, and again, it came out on Monday, <laughs> so I'm still, I've uh, certainly tabbed it, but I'm still digesting it. But um, right now, as it's, as, as it's laid out, the three structures that are contemplated, the Global, uh, global Refugee Summit, Four. Four, I think Four. Forum, there you go, let me mix up words. Global, I'm glad you said that because I've been writing about <laughs> Global Refugee Forum, the National Arrangements, which is of course um, sort of state-led coordinated efforts, and the support platform, so the effort to ensure that other states are working alongside those states that are hosting refugees, uh, don't actually have any mandated space for refugees, migrants, women's rights organizations, and that's a problem. So, we, we, we will have text on this, <laughs> and, um, but we also, I mean, just formally, what we want to see is that, that there is space specifically on each of these platforms, on each of these mechanisms for refugees, migrants, women's rights organizations, and local leadership, the host communities. Um, there's no reason they can't be on there. There's no reason they shouldn't be on there. And with the national arrangements and the support platform, while they are contemplated to be, well, and as they should be, state-led, they do not, as currently drafted, um, they allow states as currently drafted to determine who will be part of the consultation, who will be part of the implementation. So it, 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 it creates a situation in which people don't have access, or the right to access the table. So we don't see any reason that states should have the only um, ability to determine who should be at the table when host communities, refugees, migrants, and women's rights organizations have the expertise. 
So that's on that one. Um, on complementarity, uh, there's some problems. <laughs> they, they really emerged this week. Um, <laughs> I've been working a lot on this this week. So the principle of non refoulement obviously goes beyond the Refugee Convention. It can also be found in the Convention Against Torture, in the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, in the um, Convention Against uh, forced, no, Arbitrary and Forced Disappearance, it's international customary law. That's quite clear. Um, and yet today, or this week, during the negotiations towards the Global Compact on Migration, um, the text that in two places, the text that included the um, principle of non refoulement has been pushed back, and we now have uh, the Arab group, the African group, India, China, Russia, and probably a few more, saying that, that that principle should not be in the global compact on migration. So that's a huge and terrible development, and there's a whole lot of civil society that will be pushing back. And many, many states, too, the most Latin American states, Canada, uh, the European Union, also think correctly that this should be in the Global Compact on Migration. It's also specifically in the New York Declaration, as um, Bella was saying, there are sections on commitments for refugees, for migrants, and for both. Each of those sections, all of them, include the principle of non refoulement So these compacts are supposed to be um, uh, making real or, or operationalizing the New York Declaration, and they can't do that if they don't actually even include the language and the commitments that were made in the New York Declaration. So that has to change. But unfortunately, there's a problem too with the uh, Refugee Compact and it's interacting. Um, early on, um, you know, early on, let's say before June last year, and I think things really started gearing up in June last year on both compacts, um, and obviously in practice, UNHCR takes an expensive approach to its obligations, to its duties to, to assist and protect refugees. And so oftentimes, it's, it's uh, also protecting people who have other international protection concerns. So for example, those who have fled, and I'm sure Jennifer will talk about this, those who have fled um, uh, violence and um, 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 organized criminal groups in the Americas were not being recognized as refugees. And, and UNHCR rightly came out and said they are refugees. Um, and did um, you know, analysis of that. That was a good thing. It wasn't their first position, but it was a good thing, and they got there a few years ago. Um, as currently written in the Global Compact on Refugees, they have specifically talked about, they have specifically identified uh, non refoulement in two places, and in both of those places, it's specifically restricted to the Refugee Convention in 1967 Protocol, which most, many states anyway, would not Include, would not uh, suggest that it includes those displaced by uh, other types of violence that aren't originally contemplated. And that's a real problem, because on the Global Compact and Migration negotiations, states are saying, those who are saying it shouldn't go into the Migration Compact, are saying, well, it's all going to go into the Refugee Compact. That's what, that's, what we, that's what we've been told. And whether this is just positioning or it, it, it's a misunderstanding, it's a huge problem. And this draft of the Global Compact on Refugees couldn't be more clear that it only applies, I and mean, it specifically says it only applies the non refoulement clause as it arises out of the Refugee Convention in 1967 protocol. So I hope when Volker comes on June 22nd that he will clear up with states that the Refugee Compact will not be extending protection or, or, or exercising rights in protection and assistance to those who, who may not fall under the Refugee Convention because states are using that against migrants right now. On the issue of climate, it's, it's a very similar issue. So, um, Volker Turk actually <laughs> said in June of 2017 that the Global Compact on Refugees should include those displaced, and might, well, displaced, not migrant necessarily, displaced by disasters in particular because those are people who obviously are on the move because of something happening immediately and who don't have choices um, about whether they move or not. And I thought that was terrific. I was really happy. I was, I mean, we were doing work on that as well in both compacts. We've done a report on it. I'll, I'll prove it if you're interested. Um, and so we were just, we were, we were really excited that Boker Turk had come out and said that. Um, and through each draft of the, the Global Compact on Refugees, it has been weakened to the point that now there are two mentions of the climate, um, of climate or disasters in the um, to, well, in the current draft. One of them is that it's a complicate, just says that climate is a complicating factor for people who are refugees already. So not people who are 
falling under the convention, people who are in, have similar refugee-like situations, but just that it's a complicating factor. And then second, it's mentioned, um, ooh, I have to look at my notes. But anyway, it's second, it's, it's mentioned in another way that doesn't at all suggest that there's a protection um, element that this global compact should um, address. Again, this is a place where there's been huge huge pushback in the migration negotiations this week. And again, it's a place where states have said, those that are <coughs> pushing against its inclusion in the migration compact are saying, UNHCR is going to deal with it in the refugee compact. So again, that's not the case. That's more clear than ever this week. And we'll certainly be bringing the refugee compact to states this week and have been bringing it to states this week to clarify that this is not the case that it is, this is a refugee compact based on the Refugee Convention in 1967 protocol. And uh, these need to be in the migration compact. It's gonna be a, a battle. Um, and I, I really hope that the refugee compact does find language that will extend protection and assistance specifically to those displaced by climate and those in other refugee-like situations. And then finally, I just wanted to say on human rights, um, Obviously, refugees have, have rights specific to the Refugee Convention and the protocol. They also, obviously, as Bella was just talking about, have human rights that apply to all, regardless of status, regardless of where you are. You know, basic fundamental rights. Um, as currently articulated, the Refugee Compact does not, does not identify basic rights as rights. They're identified as needs. Um, this is true of, so if you want to look at section two, starting in paragraph 64 and after, <laughs> you will see a lot of basic rights that are listed that are in need of support, and that's right, but they're, they're, they're listed as needs, and they're needs subject to national laws, not subject to international human rights law, and I think that's a huge problem. And these needs that are listed are basic ones like education, livelihood, health, women's rights, and the rights of children. I know that there's a lot of difficulty in all of these issues, it's not acceptable that, that uh, a refugee compact would list rights as needs subject to national laws. So with that, I'm still actually really, I'm really excited about the equitable and predictable responsibility sharing. I think there's a lot there. Um, and um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a big um, contribution and I think it'll do a lot moving forward. I'm obviously quite concerned about some other areas. Um, and I look forward to discussion. I will have text edit suggestions for you on HCR, so please feel free to look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and I wanted to tell Bella that Overlap is not kind of a dirty word for me, okay? So, I think if there's overlap and repetition, it's, it's a good thing. Gaps are not as good, I think. So, I mean, if there's, if there's overlap, it means it's an important issue, I would say. And it's getting covered. Um, so, I, so as part of the collection, I wrote a long paper on national security and refugee protection. And my thesis was that national security and refugee protection are basically two sides of the same coin that we ought to think of them not as in conflict, but as complementary goals. And, you know, host communities want to be safe, but, of course, so do refugees. And as a factual matter, if you don't have a secure um, system of admissions, you, you're less likely to have robust refugee protection policies. I think that's relevant to the global compacts, and that some states are raising the issue of sovereignty, which, of course, does have a security dimension, and they're treating sovereignty and refugee protection as conflicting goals, and maybe even internet, you know, robust international migration in sovereignty. So I wanted to make four quick points, and the first one is on sovereignty, which is that sovereignty is not just about national defense, it's not just about border control or homeland security. Sovereign states under international law exist to safeguard rights, right? And more broadly, to provide the conditions that allow their members to flourish. The um, international law does not privilege fortress states. That's clear. You know, states whose rulers can do whatever they want to, to people within their boundaries and don't have any responsibilities to people beyond their boundaries. And I mean, I mean, if you think about the progression of international law on the issue of sovereignty, you could start, say, you know, with the covenants on civil and political rights and economic and social and cultural rights 
which require states to safeguard the rights of their own people. That's a, that was a big deal, and it is a big deal. Or the genocide, the genocide convention that recognizes an exception to freedom from outside interference by other states. Or Article 33 of the Refugee Convention that prevents states from returning people to situations of persecution or where they have been persecuted. The same applies to the Torture Convention. Or you can think about the inter moving down the line here, the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty in 2001, which recognizes the responsibility of states to defend the rights of persons in other states that persecute and violate the rights of their own residents. All of this kind of leads to a big sovereignty question to me, and that is, what does sovereignty actually mean in the face of challenges like international migration, refugee protection, national security, for that matter, that really can't be effectively resolved by states individually? And it seems to me that in, the, in those kinds of circumstances and on those kinds of issues, all the responsibilities of sovereign states would argue for states to work together. It would be an expression of sovereignty, in other words, not a, and a necessity really to work with other states to solve problems for your members that you couldn't solve alone. So I think that's an important kind of framework as we're, as we're talking about sovereignty, and states are talking about sovereignty. The second point I wanted to make is I think that it reflects a misunderstanding of national security, as I said, to see that concept is at odds with refugee protection. You know, as a factual matter, refugees aren't terrorists or criminals or the way that they're portrayed. They're victims of terrorists, criminals, and repressive states. And yet, yeah, I mean, it's true that bad people do try to occasionally impersonate refugees, which is why screening is vitally important. But the truth is that the most obvious security concerns related to refugees are the ones we almost never hear about in the public discourse anymore, which is... Um, which is, these are people that are fleeing for their lives. They're looking for a measure of human security. And if national security is about anything, it's about human security. I mean, what's security about if it's not about protection of human beings? And furthermore, policies that prevent refugees from reaching safety don't further security or honor the concept of sovereignty by any but the most constricted sense of either of those terms. The other point to make is I think that the myriad contributions of refugees to the economic welfare of society and to many other, the many other contributions they make, they also further security. The third point I want to make is that every act of refugee protection, and I think this is a really important point, every act of refugee protection actually promotes security. Think about it, you know, from addressing or mitigating refugee produce producing conditions, things like violence, poverty, fragile states, educating and allowing forcibly displaced people, including refugees, to work, creating more legal migration opportunities for them, whether based on family ties or work or humanitarian visas or whatever, integrating them into host communities, resettling them in third countries, creating conditions that allow refugees to turn home, return home voluntarily and safely. In, in uh, the article that I wrote, I quote Michael Chertoff, who's the former DHS commissioner, and he's kind of a famed mafia prosecutor as well. So this is a person that's not an opponent to national security or to law and order. And this is what he has to say about refugee protection. He says, quote, you don't want to have a situation where people are just stagnating in camps year in and out because you're creating essentially a hospitable environment for people to recruit extremists and criminals then. So I think you've got to look at the system end to end, and part of that means dealing with countries that are failed states. Where you do have a war and you do have flight, you need to have a robust system for housing people, continuing to educate them, processing them in a secure um, and reasonable time frame, and frankly, this is enough of a global issue that it warrants the whole global community kicking in large money to make sure that that could be operated in an efficient way. And finally, when people do qualify for asylum and are moved into host <laughs> countries, there has to be a process in place to integrate them, to get them educated, to make sure they can find work so they become productive members of society and are not simply embittered clusters of people who are marginalized. What's he talking about there? 
He's talking about the whole continuum of refugee protection and how all of that furthers security. And that's a, and that's a security expert speaking. And the, kind of the fourth point and the final point I want to make, and obviously I'm not talking about the particular provisions in either of the compacts here, but just kind of the overarching theme and wh where there's pushback on some of the kind of progressive and expansive things that ought to be in these compacts. But the fourth point is the crisis in global displacement, and we know this, and Andrew mentioned this, is really not a refugee or a migrant crisis. What it is, is really a crisis in responsibility, sharing, and solidarity. The causes of this crisis are war, conflict, fragile states, breakdown in the rule of law, gross poverty, climate change, and other conditions that displace people. Is a corollary, refugees and other forcibly displaced people, and Andrew was very strong on this point, as, as was Bella, um, they enjoy far too few opportunities for permanent solutions to return home safely, to migrate legally in other ways, to become citizens in their host communities, or to resettle in third countries. The fact is, is that the world needs greater solidarity and collaboration to resolve a crisis of this magnitude, as it needed solidarity to resolve the crisis of refugees after World War II, or after the Vietnam conflict, or after any number of conflicts or disasters, man-made and others. So, this, I, I, I have to editorialize a little bit now about what's going on in the United States, where we are, where you really see it turning away from protection programs, whether it's the refugee resettlement um, program or the political asylum, or the, the many barriers that are being put up to political asylum now, or really the gutting of temporary protected status, or the elimination of the Central American Miners Program, or on and on. You, and you have measures of unprecedented cruelty. I, there's almost no historical analog to the idea of the prosecution of asylum seekers and the separation of young children from their parents who are, who are going to be criminally prosecuted. For what? For basically seeking asylum, for trying to reach, at, reach protection. Um, and why? In order to deter others from trying to do the same, which they're allowed to do on, on our international law. And that's not working, and it's not going to work. However, what it does do is it does undermine our values and our global standing. And for present purposes, I think it's really troubling because these measures undermine the very vision that's necessary to make the GCR work. That, in other words, what's happening here is not at all about solidarity or responsibility sharing. And you need that vision, no matter how strong these documents ultimately are, you need to have that vision and that commitment in place. So I'm really hoping that at some point our administration recognizes this fact and that it sees sovereignty and it sees security and it sees refugee protection as part of a virtuous circle. Okay? Thank you. I'm Jennifer. Thank you very much to CMS for um, hosting this, for putting together the journal on these topics, which I think is going to be really important, not just for this moment, but in the future when we're in a better position to be making repairs to what's happening right now. I'm going to um, start off by kind of going off of um, Don's talk and really thinking about you know, this, uh, the balance and the important balance that we have between ensuring that governments and countries can have predictability but also ensuring that that predictability doesn't lead us down a path of deterrence or stopping migration when there really needs to be um, an emergency valve in certain situations and ensuring that predictability isn't outweighing any sort of protection concerns and um, protection responsibilities that governments have. We have to make sure that we don't get in a situation where border management is prioritized over protection when it's necessary. Right, and we also want to make sure that countries um, aren't given a, a free pass and that neither of these mechanisms are used to give um, some sort of permission to governments to say that you can control your way out of any sort of obligations that are going to kick in into all these other nice compacts and, and conventions that you've signed in the past. So we want to make sure that we're not saying to governments, you know, really focus on predictability, focus on how you can do management, how can you work together, because if you're able to keep everybody off your shores, then none of those requirements are going to be triggered because no one's going to be able to get to your border and access territorial protection, right? So we want to make sure that as we're thinking about 
what is the burden sharing and how are governments going to work together that we're not um, uh, giving a silent nod to border externalization, not allowing particularly countries with more resources to pay their way out of any sort of obligations because they're not going to have people who are able to reach their borders. I think I'll stop there on that, and we can talk more about it. But I also wanted to just um, talk about the role of um, and the issue of unaccompanied and separated children, which are which is feature which are featured prominently in both compacts. Um, I think it is you know a big relief um, for the uh, rights community, particularly children's advocates, to see this population highlighted um, in both. And I think that there is a robust um, community uh, advocating for these protections. Um, I do think that there has been a little bit of a paternalism to this population. And so I think that we should really think about what is it the language that we're talking about? Because there's a lot about protection in the best interest of the children, which are absolutely important. I do not want to minimize the importance of this. But what I do want to say is that it is really important to think about what are the children's needs and are the children themselves able to voice those needs? And are we having that their um, right to be heard? Is that really being recognized in all of this? So that we're able to balance uh, their needs and voices with adequate protection because they are children. Um, for example, a lot of the um, uh, protections and rights you know, that, that would be the assignment of guardians, um, the notification and involvement of some sort of child protection officer, um, the focus on the best interest of the children, right? So all of these are fantastic, and these, all of these are absolutely important, but I just want to dig a little bit deeper just for a moment to see what these definitions actually mean, because they mean different things in different countries, and I think we need to be very clear and very specific what we're talking about. So for example, this idea of a guardian for a child, right? That looks very different in different contexts and in different countries. A guardian is often seen as kind of a parent, a parental figure, kind of that responsibility. So someone who would speak for the child, right? And that person might have an analysis that's different about what is going to be in the best interest of the child or what should happen to that child. That could look very different from what the child wants and what the child is saying. And so we need to make sure that when we're talking about appoint appointments of guardians, that we're also talking about not excluding the appointment of counsel, right? Because an attorney, counsel, that's going to be the child's voice. And so we want to make sure that we're hearing both, right? We're hearing what the guardian is saying, that there is somebody who's appointed to make decisions as appropriate and to raise the best interest concerns, but that, that it's not at the exclusion of having the child's voice heard. The other idea is this concept of a child protection officer being appointed in situations where there's a separated or unaccompanied child. Again, absolutely important. We want there to be specialized people with training looking out for the needs of these children. But I think we also have to think about where is this person sitting? I think we need to be very specific. What is the responsibility and what is, who is that person answering to? Is that person answering to a migration official? Is that person answering to uh, the state child welfare entity? And be very clear about what that's going to be because their recommendations about what's going to be the best interest of that child will vary dramatically depending on who they're answering to and who they're speaking for as the officer. You know, the one issue that's gotten a lot of attention is this idea of detention of children, right? We started off very strong where we were going to say, you know, absolutely no detention of children. And now it's like, well, you know, we're really hoping that we don't have to do that. Um, so that's very concerning. But I also think, too, we really need to think about what is it that we're saying when we say no detention? Does that mean, you know, a border official apprehends a child and says, you're a child, we're not allowed to detain anymore, so here's your paperwork, you know, come back in six months when you want to see the judge. You know, where is that kid going to go? There is a responsibility that's different when you're talking about children, about the care and custody versus detention. And so I think, and as we're thinking about this, negotiating it, fighting about what the language is really going to look like, when we say, you know, no detention, or we say there has to be an alternative, what does that really mean? We have to really think about what is the care and custody responsibility that we have to this uh, population because of protection needs 
versus punitive detention. And I think, again, if, we're, if we can be as specific as possible with the language, I think we might not only get further, um, you know, closer to our goal about what we really mean, uh, but that, and that's going to result in countries being able to think more creatively about what they do when they do have a kid who's separated or unaccompanied at the border, so they don't have to throw them into something that looks like a jail-like detention facility, right? The other thing I wanted to talk about is really thinking about what are the durable solutions for children. Um, I think, you know, there are moments in which we're saying to governments, you know, how can you make a decision about a kid for the rest of their life when they're six years old, right? On the other hand, we're saying, oh, there's other countries who are saying, we're not going to make any decision. But the day they turn 18, they either go into an adult detention facility or they have to go back to their home country, in the case of Europe, you know, and that's it. So thinking about while the person's still a child, if we're not going to be putting that, making final decisions about their case, how, what are the other mechanisms we can use to ensure that they have a durable solution, that we're not just biding time until we say, okay, they've turned 18, now they're adult, now they can be subject to all these other <laughs> grotesque results that we have, or, or immigration laws, that we were just postponing, right? That's not helpful for the kids. Kids need a durable solution. They deserve, you know, if they're going to be getting these other rights that they have, you know, that they're, they have access to, right, right to education, um, family unity, we can't all of a sudden take that away from them when they're 18. So we really need to think about what's a durable solution that we can think about for these kids while they're still young that is not going to change the moment they turn 18. Um, and I can't help but I know Donna already talked a little bit about family separation, but um, you know, I've been living and breathing this for the past few weeks. Um, you know, really thinking about what are the rights that we're talking about right now and what are the concepts. You know, I think when people are talking about family separation, they're thinking of that moment, you know, that horrific moment um, when that child is taken from that parent. What does that mean? And I know, you know, there's been really great media about it, and I think that's very important because I think that's breaking through and making people think about the issues that we all work on and care about very much. I think it's helping us translate to people who don't think about these or know about these issues very much. But we also need to think about what's the longer term, what are the longer term issues that we're thinking about, what are the other implications of this. So, you know, absolutely family unity, right? When we're talking about kids, we're, we're talking a lot about in these compacts, you know, right to family unity or right to family reunification. Is that temporary? Is that a permanent right that we're talking about? What does that mean? Is that siblings? Is that just parent and child? Um, and, you know, also thinking creatively about what family could mean. I think, again, this is about the right to be heard, for the child to be heard, right? So when you take that parent away from the child, who then speaks for the child? We don't really have a solution, particularly in the United States right now. They don't necessarily get a legal guardian at any point, and they're not necessarily getting an attorney, right? So of those two perspectives, kind of having somebody speaking as a legal guardian, as well as having the ensuring that the child's voice is going to be heard, we don't have that either. Obviously, detention. Right, these kids are lingering in Customs and Border Protection facilities, which is detention, right? It's different than a protective um, custodial setting, right? That is you know, punitive detention. Um, detention is being used as a deterrent, as, as Don and Kevin mentioned. Um, and then again, you know, the entire overall point of this is, you know, can governments be utilizing and abusing children um, and manipulating the situ situation in a way to use kids to deter adults and other refugees and asylum seekers. So I just had to mention it. But I also think, too, bigger picture is that, you know, what's being happen what's happening right now, it's a crisis that's being manufactured. It's being intentionally manufactured, right? We're getting buildups at the border of kids. We're having facilities overrun, uh, maximum flows. We're having people who are being turned away at ports of entry because they're saying uh, ports are full. So it's creating this crisis, which is going to allow policymakers to say, well, we need to do something to fix it. What is it that's going to fix it? We need to change our laws. We need to stop people from getting here. Let's expand externalization by making Mexico a safe third country. Then we wipe our hands clean of any of the responsibilities we have that are triggered when someone's accessing protection at our border. So we really need to be very critical about this and, and speak about it for what it really is to ensure that the response isn't to further roll back protections or expand ex our externalization of our own border and ensure that we're maintaining the, the systems and, and the integrity of the systems that we have that are existing already. So I'll stop there. I was going to give Andrew 
the floor first to sort of respond to what anything you heard, and then we can we can open it to the floor. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess just thanks for the opportunity to respond to a couple points. I'll just pick up on a few points that the colleague made. Great presentations, by the way. Thanks very much. Uh, I agree with most of them. Um, one thing, I guess, for, for, for Bella on the circles, um, you know, I'm one of the people who, who thinks it's not necessarily a bad thing to have separate processes, and I don't think Bella and I disagree on that. No? We don't? No, we don't. Okay. Well, then I'll just say it in the abstract. Um, I think that what those circles show is the need for coherence. Um, some have argued uh, that there, there, should be one, there should have been one process, uh, dealing with both of the compacts. And I think perhaps a rebuttal to that is even though you have that area, the two that intersect, you have that area in the middle where you have the, the same population with, with similar leaves, we do have compacts that are approaching it in different ways. And we have a negotiation process that could end up affecting the bigger parts of those two circles. And I think we need to, to bear that in mind where we're the big part of the refugee circle is looking at issues that are very unique to refugees in many respects, in, in terms of where the, the regime is, et cetera, um, as well as really the rights and needs specific to refugees. And the same thing for migrants. Um, so just, just one comment on that, maybe not a response. Um, so Nani made a number of points, uh, fairly specific points, that I just wanted to, and of course I'm madly looking at, my, at the GCR um, on that. A few things on the non reform law principle, just to say that I did check the reference. Um, it says the cardinal principle of non reform law, and at the core of which is the 1951 convention. Right, the global compact is grounded in international refugee protection regime, centered on the cardinal principle of non reform law, and at the core of which is the 1951 convention. So I don't think we would ever say that non reform law is limited to the 51 convention. We have a very strong interest not to do that because, and this was a big issue, this is an issue in the New York Declaration where there were efforts by some states to do that, because then that basically, you lose the hook for those states that haven't signed the 51 Convention. So um, I think we're, we're extremely sensitive to that. Um, in terms of the breadth uh, and the gap, I guess I would just go back to the point that I had made earlier, and thanks for raising the example of the gangs. Um, because sometimes when, when for, for, for UNHCR, we hear of the gaps, um, we hear people fleeing armed conflicts, people fleeing violence against gangs. Yes, UNHCR has recognized these people as refugees, but so have many states. Um, so I think what we learn from that is that the refugee concept does envelop, does in, uh, encompass people fleeing gang violence, people fleeing armed conflicts. And we don't want to put it out there to say, well, UNHCR, maybe a couple of states have, but everybody else hasn't. And therefore, we need to deal with this in the global compact on migration. Because at that point, we're starting to say, we can start narrowing that definition now. And, and on the flip side of it, states can say, oh, good, all right. So that doesn't fall in. Let's, let's move it over to the migration compact, where there are not the same legal obligations. And I think there is a bit of a, an interest for some member states to say, oh, let's move it over there. And that's creating a bit of a challenge. And so I'm going to rightly note it. The language gets reduced as we go along because even the language that is in there, um, there's a language that we think is a, a perfectly legitimate uh, expression of refugee protection. When we go beyond that to talk about climate change, uh, and there are still references to climate change in there, we can talk about that, um, there is pushback from states um, that say you're going beyond refugee protection, this is a refugee compact, this is a refugee compact. Um, and we still have managed to retain at this point, we'll see how long it lasts. Um, in paragraph, sorry, we're going to get to the point of paragraphs now. You actually uh, have like a sideline. <laughs> no, no, but I think it's important because the climate change is an important one. Um, there is language in there about the need to unidentified protection needs. Um, that stakeholders with relevant mandates and expertise will provide guidance and support for measures to address other, other protection and humanitarian challenges, including those forces that are displaced by natural disasters. And there was efforts to get rid of that word protection. Uh, and we'll have to see how that lasts. But I think one thing is, you know, you'll probably find it as well in the GCM as it goes along, is 
Sometimes it's a matter of taking when you have six references in, you take out four of them, but you leave two of them in. Um, and that's the same thing I would say with the human rights language, where a lot of the human rights language in the GCR is front-loaded at the beginning, with the idea that these are standing principles that flow throughout the document, um, as well as with regard to the best interest determinations um, and other things. Um, oh, just uh, for Jennifer, thanks very much for, for some of that. I mean, clearly uh, an expert on the, on the child protection side. Um, and I think if you have suggestions on, on adjusting language, that would be great. I think the challenge for all of these is there's only so much detail we can get into. Um, so it's a question of making sure we're having it at a high enough, high enough level um, that we can just fit it in. One of the things is this is now two pages shorter um, because at the same time that member states keep saying add this, add this, add this, as well as, as civil society, add this, add this. At the same time they say it's getting too long, it's getting too long, it's getting too long. So there were efforts, for example, to front load a lot of things at the beginning. Like the best interest of the child, that guides this document. Boom, 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 boom. So you're not going to have best interest noted throughout. Um, but if there is language um, that, that is also understandable to states, I think that would be, that would be helpful. So that's it. Thanks. OK. Um, thanks for all your presentations. A uh, lot to think about. We can open it up to the floor for questions. If you just come to the microphone and identify yourself, that would be great. Hello. I'm Catherine Gennaro from uh, Georgetown. Uh, and Rosa Sage this year. I have a few questions. Whoever wants to answer, that would be great. Um, OK. So first. We're talking about coherence and complementarity across the two compacts. And, uh, and the fact is, is that, as was mentioned, right, UNHCR often uh, has a wide kind of scope around the world and deals both with refugees, certainly, but also other people, right, that, that come within their, their scope and their reach. Um, and those people sometimes are not people who become refugees, who technically are not eligible to become refugees, but they're, they're migrants. So it's just kind of interesting to hear, I don't know if IOM is in the room, but it just, as soon as I heard that REACH comment, which I totally believe and know about UNHCR, I just wondered, IOM also has, you know, is, is often out there, wherever <laughs> there is, and, and has a broad REACH as well at times. Although clearly, I know there's protocols, you know, between both of these agencies. So if you could speak to that, that would be great with respect to the compacts and, you know, what we're seeing um, in terms of uh, negotiations. Um, secondly, you know, state representation, everyone mentioned how different states are, are obviously involved in, in this process. Um, how much state representation is really involved? Um, I mean, I just wonder, in theory, in practice, you know, are all states coming to the table at all, you know, rounds of, of these negotiations? Um, I imagine there's, you know, as, as some people mentioned, you know, there, there appear to be some states maybe uh, pushing some things at certain times, where are they at other times, et cetera. If anybody could speak to that, uh, that would be great. Um, and then, if you could, Jennifer, say a little bit more about the construction of what I call the child migrant at the border problem we, we seem to be engaging in in the U.S. Um, and uh, I'll leave that over with, with some specificity. That would be great. I could talk about the first one, maybe? Yeah, sure. Um, on the coherence issue, thanks for that. Um, I mean, indeed, uh, the reality is we, we, we have mixed movements. Uh, we have refugees and migrants moving together. Um, and I think for UNHCR, its partnership with IOM is, is critical uh, in that regard. Um, and when people arrive at a shore, we're not asking, are you a refugee or are you a migrant? We're, we're dealing with meeting the, the specific needs. But then ultimately, putting them in the systems that can best address whatever those needs are. And for some, for example, might be for migrants to, to return home. Um, and this has been an issue, I mean, the, the, the language of mixed movements or whatever you want to call it has been a sticky point um, in the negotiations uh, and the consultations. 
uh, with some member states not wanting in the GCR any reference to migrants. In the GC yes, in the GCR any reference to migrants. Um, and for UNHCR, I think we, we've been trying to say this is a reality. Um, this refugee compact deals with how we deal ultimately with refugees, but there is an, a point of initial reception where basic needs have to be met. Um, you'll even see in the language of the, the refugee compact, it doesn't actually use the word refugees when we're talking about reception arrangements, it talks about people. Um, and it has references to, to the work with IOM. So, um, and it's the same thing in the GCM. So I think there are dangers, and I think others have alluded here, to, to member states playing one compact off the other. Um, and what, what New York crowd says should be picked up by Geneva might not necessarily be picked up by their permanent mission in, in Geneva. And I think we do have to keep an eye on um, having member states remain consistent um, in, in what they're saying on, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I think, um, I think IOM has, I think UNHCR and IOM, we are trying to also talk to each other during this because we know that IOM is going to have a strong role in the implementation of the GCM recognizing again that we have these mixed movements and we have to, to make sure that we have not only coherence in the documents, but coherence in the implementation at the end of the day. Alex, do you want to try the second question? Yes, exactly. Thanks, and uh, I have to leave in a few minutes because I'm uh, meeting in three. Um, yeah, on the state response, uh, state representation in the negotiation. So, in the well, first of all, we have to remind ourselves that the process of developing the compact is quite different. One is led by the General Assembly through a process of intergovernment negotiations. That's the migration one, and the refugee one is a process led by UNHCR in consultation with member states and other stakeholders. So. I don't know about the participation of member states in those consultations on the refugee compact. Uh, maybe I used the wrong word, but I call them consultations. And, and but certainly here at the General Assembly, it is uh, all the entire General Assembly minus the U.S. As you remember, they pulled back from the negotiations late last year. They're negotiating in different groups, and certain countries are more interested than others. But in principle, it's all it's, it's uh, all minus one, so to speak, that are engaging. Now, for me, the interesting question will so the, the the global compact on migration will be is to be adopted at the intergovernmental conference in Morocco at the end of this year, officially. Uh, but also the refugee compact, and that's what re uh, Andrew was referring to, is in the end going to be adopted by member states and uh, in through the third committee this fall. It's annexed to the report of the High Commissioner. And so, for me, actually, the big question is, um, you know, will the, will member states, how, how this is going to be, will member states open the negotiations on the text, which is basically agency-led so far? Because he, purely, if you look at the language, you can see the whole different drafting and the nature of the language in the refugee compact and the migration compact. So that's, for me, kind of a, a, a question. But it, then also, in terms of follow-up and review and implementation, the one is clearly state-led, uh, where you see in the follow-up and review certainly of the migration compact to continue state-led process. Yes, there were some com comments in the room about how civil society and other stakeholders will contribute to that. Uh, whereas I think in our language from the General Assembly, probably the fora of the refugee compact, in other words, the follow-up and review of the refugee compact, is voluntary and, you know, without uh, a state-led process. I don't think, I, I didn't see in the text, but there will not be probably a negotiated, uh, how do they call it in the migration compact? I think a progress declaration, is that the, the word they're using? I don't think there will be an intergovernmental outcome from those fora, for example, uh, from the refugee compact, but maybe I misread it and it's, it is there. But any time, will, the outcome of which will be brought to the General Assembly from the fora, for example, through possibly a report to the third committee, then there is an opportunity for the General Assembly, I think, to, to look at that outcome. But I'm not even sure that the mechanisms of that are clearly spelled out uh, in the refugee conflict. But again, it's, as you all said, it was just issued recently, so I haven't really uh, looked at the details. So on that question, if I understood it, on the state participation, 
I mean, in the negotiations, there are a lot of states that don't say anything. And, and there are blocks of state. I mean, there's, for the EU, Austria has been doing all the, the talking for 27 other states. Whether all those states agree with everything that Austria is saying is unclear because there are other European nations <coughs> saying other things, not necessarily contradictory things, but for the compromises, like Switzerland will throw out compromises in the middle of the negotiation. No part of the EU. Oh, what's that? Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Good point. Anyway, uh, but there have been other European nations have, that have done that. Um, so it, it's been curious to me, like, why certain, like Lebanon, for example, wasn't very involved in there, and now all of a sudden, their red line is not, I mean, they've been, that's all they say, it's the non reforma is our red line. And understand, I can understand where they're coming from, because they have, you know, too many refugees in their country, but, <clears throat> but it, it's sort of hit and miss. And, for example, Germany hasn't said a word during the whole process. Um, and, you know, the response from the German delegation, well, we already do all this stuff, so why, why? Well, we, uh, well, but we need you there to say you're doing all this stuff, is the point. <laughs> um, so it, it's just, for me, looking at the, the participation, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you sort of wonder why some state, some member states stay out of it, you know. Um, I mean, we know why U.S. is not even there, but why they, some of the member states who are part of the process aren't speaking, and they have their different reasons, I guess. Sorry. Okay, um, so I just wanted to say that um, I think the most important thing on complementarity is that there's cl that that that, that um, just between the two, that there's clarity that both can deal. You know, we can overlap. Both can deal with some issues where that that the the uh, the ad, no, the if it doesn't happen, there's actually going to be a drop in protection uh, of people who absolutely you know, need shared protection and humanitarian response for. I mean, I think a good example of this is the Rohingya people. Um, about, yeah, about 650,000 of them fled to Bangladesh in just over a month. I mean, that's Bangladesh. <laughs> it's amazing. And they let them come. Um, Bangladesh is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention. It, it calls them migrants. Um, we want to make sure that whether people are refugees, you know, sort of they, they, they are, they fall under the defi definition of whether they are recognized as refugees, does not um, undermine their ability to seek, receive, um, and enjoy protection and humanitarian assistance. So I think a lot of it is just about clarifying language between the two. Not just, oh actually, just one thing with IOM, just to say that in the follow-up and um, the follow-up mechanisms that are being proposed, IOM is, is um, identified right now as a coordinator or a secretariat in different pieces. Um, that's, it, it's pretty, it hasn't been fleshed out. That's where it is right now. Although the SRS, the special representative to the Secretary General, did speak today a bit more about the detail, but I missed it. So I was reading the refugee comment. <laughs> <laughs> the the last thing I would say before I get to the you know situation at our at our southern border right now too is this idea of the mixed flows. You know, not to beat a dead horse on this, but there's also I think you know for adults and certainly for children, you're going to have the same person who's going to be a migrant at one point, could be a refugee at another point, could be the smuggler, right, at another point. And so I think you know the other risk of having two separate procedures is that you know we're talking about the same individual, right? So we need to make sure that that same person, they still have the same rights, same vulnerabilities, even if at one moment they might be recognized in one category, and another moment in another category. I think, you know, specifically about the structure at the border, what's happening, this, this administration has doubled down on what other, you know, particularly the previous administration's goals of deterring refugee flows, right, and externalizing our border, right? So those are kind of two separate things in order to not trigger the responsibilities and the procedures and the protections that are granted when somebody arrives, right? So we have done things like paid for radio campaigns that told people it's really dangerous to walk in the desert. And then we said to Mexico, you know, here's a big old check and we're going to buy you drones and we're going to buy you radios and we need you to stop the people from coming here, right, in the first place. So these are things we've done to deter, you know, we've done a lot to externalize, right, so we don't trigger any of the protections. Um, and I think, you know, the next 
part of this, you know, the next level of this is the you know family separations that's happening to both deter, um, but also to create a crisis, right? We're manufacturing a crisis at a point when arrivals are not that high at our southwest border, so that we can you know even further expand our externalization and, and um, shield ourselves from protections by you know there being political will to say declare Mexico to be a safe third country, right? That's really going to you know clear a lot of responsibility off of this uh, government, and you know I think we have to be really careful about that. And we saw that the numbers that came out that yesterday yeah. um, have shown some increase in the children, right, and the families coming. Right. Yeah. So I should so, say failed attempts. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just shows that the deterrence doesn't work. So. Uh, any other questions at the moment on the floor? I want to ask Andrew about resettlement and uh, how that, how he sees that playing out in the compact in the, in the months ahead as, it, as the compact becomes implemented because we're seeing a crisis in resettlement here in, in this country which was a major resettler, was the leading resettler. Um, We'll be lucky to get 20,000 this year. Um, and it just seems like in, in the responsibility sharing framework that of all the needs to respond to a refugee crisis, that uh, resettlement is one that is, is, is a, a very important, but states are mo most reluctant to give. So is, is there some sort of hook or some sort of, are, are all these possible services that a nation can sign up for equal or is there a way that the compact can sort of encourage states to provide more resettlement slots or, or is it just is it just written in a way that this is another option for you um, in terms of you know responsibility sharing as opposed to we want to just fund this project on women or, for example um, I mean there is a section First of all, to, uh, for those of you not as familiar, there's a section in the Global Compact on Solutions. Um, and, we have, and that includes uh, voluntary repatriation, which is the first thing that member states want to talk about. Um, resettlement um, or complementary pathways for admission. Um, and local integration or temporary stay. And certainly resettlement, I mean, it's, it's still in the compact um, as uh, a very tangible way that states can share the responsibility. One of the most easily demonstrable ways of sharing responsibility, and it has aspirations in it uh, in terms of what's achieved. I think importantly, um, it also tries to highlight some other ways where we can increase the numbers, recognizing that we have a huge challenge today, today, uh, in the next few years, uh, perhaps, um, in terms of those resettlement numbers. But looking at things like community sponsorship, uh, which you see in Canada. There's the Global Refugee Sponsorship uh, Initiative, uh, where we're trying to encourage replication of that model, where in, in addition to, and not instead of, but in addition to governments uh, resettling people and providing support, communities would do that, um, or individuals would do that. And there's been interest in that from some other uh, new countries um, to take that on. And another program in terms of providing support to emerging uh, resettlement countries in terms of technical support and how to run a resettlement program and things like that. So it's still very much there, um, but, uh, and I think there is room uh, to grow it. The compact envisions that there would be a three year strategy developed uh, on resettlement, and I think in a large part to try and work out sort of how we can do this in, in the landscape that we're in right now. Um, and that's intended to tie in, I think, with a second Global Refugee Forum in 2021, which will be the 70th anniversary of the 51, 70th, 60th, 70th, yeah, of the, uh, the, <laughs> of the 1951 convention, 60th, uh, 20, 70th, thank you. <laughs> I can do that. I'm good at other things, but not math. So um, I think that will be an opportunity to really try and work that out uh, while we keep the core elements in, in the compact. Margaret O'Dwyer, Company of the Daughters of Charity. Just two questions. 
Um, I'm really concerned with the compact on migration. Really, it appears to me to leave people who are displaced by climate issues left behind. And I'm just wondering, as we enter into the home stretch of discussions, what I, it sounds like there's not an appetite for new categories, which it seems to me is really what is needed. But what are those few more aspects we can push for in terms of people displaced by climate issues? Second question is, is it too early to know or to have a sense of creative ways civil society can be involved in the review process? Thank you. Um, on, so I should say the current text of the Global Compact on Migration is actually really terrific on climate and disasters. Um, it's, the problem is this week states are saying like delete that, delete all of that, <laughs> delete that part too, <laughs> and do that part there. Um, and so it, it's a state process, it's a state negotiation. So the, co -two, the two co-facilitators who are Mexico and Switzerland. Um, have to figure out how they're going to manage this. Um, there's also, I mean, on the flip side, I should also, also say there are plenty of states that are saying, no, we got to keep this in. So it's where does it it's sort of where is the momentum and where is the force is is, is ultimately the um, the question. And of course, that's it's a different process. But of course, in UNHCR in, in drafting is also going through those sorts of back and forth and how do we make this work for everyone. Um, so I think you're right to be worried. And there is actually a lot of civil society working on uh, both global compacts. This week in New York at the negotiations, there's 35 organizations from around the world here, mostly national and local organizations, and it's not the first time they've been here. It's, it's really exciting to see, actually. This is a legacy as well that is um, important. Um, and then in terms of how can you get involved, the, well, if you want to get involved in sort of editing drafts, that's certainly possible. Um, basically, I mean, the way you, the strategy behind it, though, is to um, you have to get your edits to states because ultimately it's states who say what they want. So that's that's how you get it done. I mean, certainly you can also um, and you can do that obviously through social media. There's lots of ways to do it. You don't have to be going to the negotiations every day. Um, there's lots of organizations who are doing it, so there's areas that are important to you. Of course, you can submit language changes to civil society, and we'll work with them as well. Um, but I will say the ball is rolling unbelievably fast now. We have about six weeks left for both. Um, you know, the UNHCR has provided what they're saying is, I think, the final draft, right? This. Okay. Or we didn't have it. Good to know. No, no, no. I, I, I don't want to actually be on the record on that. <laughs> there could well be another draft after this one. Okay. So, um, you know, so there's some room there, and it's the same with the, the migration compact. It's supposed to only have one more draft. I mean, that may change because it's become very intense. So there are opportunities. Um, I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> Maybe just a compliment. Um, you know, I think for UNHCR, I think there's, there's much more on climate change in the GCN than there is in the GCR. Um, but uh, certainly for UNHCR, we would like to see it in both. Um, and in fact, with the New York Declaration, that was one of our uh, disappointments with the New York Declaration is in fact that uh, the climate change stuff was all on the, the commitments to migrants. Um, but there is language, as Bella said, that talks about how some can apply to both, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and the challenge for us is, of course, the member states that, that don't want to see reference uh, to climate change in there. But um, I'm hopeful that uh, they will be able to stay in there. Um, the civil society, I think this is an issue that Sanata also mentioned, um, uh, raised in terms of the, the review processes. And I don't know if you're talking about um, review in terms of the, the global compacts themselves or the follow-up mechanisms. But um, I think uh, certainly th there is reference to stakeholders in, in some of these forums, but it, perhaps that could be strengthened um, or made more explicit, uh, recognizing, of course, some sensitivities as well um, on that. But I think uh, also if we can, it's always good if we can strengthen the references to refugee participation in, in those communities. So I think those are also good points that were made earlier. Thanks. Yeah, one disturbing development on Tuesday was during the stakeholder hearing where the civil society is able to speak, a few of us raised the idea for the GCM of reporting requirements or national implementation plans, and we were very rebuked by one of the co-facilitators. They have no intention of having some sort of reporting requirement for member states, 
which begs the question of, okay, what are we doing wasting our time here? But um, they want to create a, a, a political ecosystem within the UN on migration. So they, they have a meeting every four years where they're going to talk about progress, but there's really no objective criteria that I see that can measure that progress. And one of the concerns of civil society is where, where does civil society plug in to ensure that there is at least some implementation moving on. So there, a lot of those discussions are happening behind the scenes right now. I don't know where they are in the, they might have been talking about implementation today, but um, there might be a modalities resolution that allows civil society to participate in some of the processes. But, um, but from what I see, there's no really requirement that people, that people that member states sort of account for what they're doing, and there's even a paragraph that's written in a way that can be interpreted that member states can pick and choose which objectives they want to implement. So, so there's a lot of work to be done on that particular piece moving forward and how civil society fits into it. Please. Hi, um, I'm Janet Riley from Sarah Lawrence College. Um, thank you so much, because this has been really informative and really interesting. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on whether, or to what extent, this process of the two global compacts is in itself uh, a problem. You know, the, it seems like it's more of the same kind of discussion of the last 20, 30 years of mandate creep of, you know, UNHCR and whether, um, who's a refugee and by then, you know, counter um, question, who's not, um, which kind of begs the question, who's worthy of protection and then who's not, right? And I, I take the point that Jennifer made, um, I think it's really uh, a good one that, you know, not to let the process of formalizing mechanisms for burden sharing become uh, a formal, you know, system of uh, protect, um, order protection um, that then makes it, uh, that it limits the asylum regime, you know, and the, the refugee regime. Um, so so it's, it, I, I just wanted your thoughts on whether this whole process of the two compacts is itself kind of part of the problem. You know, like, how much it speaks to this whole discussion about the confusion or the dis uh, debate over the definition of refugee. Sure. Um, thanks. I don't, you know, I'd like to think, maybe just because I'm with your name, it's not a question of mission creep. Um, but it's really a question of ensuring that people who have certain legal rights under international law are able to access them. Um, and, and that's why I think it is important to have a pretty clear idea of who a refugee is, because there is an international legal regime that's in place for them. And as many people who can benefit from that, I think is in everybody's interest. Um, Ideally, we would have a system as well, I mean, beyond the, the basic human rights system, which applies to all, that we would have mechanisms and we would have a legal regime that provides protection to migrants with a similar kind of vitality, recognizing that they have different needs. Um, I think, in many respects, refugees and migrants do have different needs. Refugees are going back to countries civil war. Now, that's not to say that those are worse or better, or, but they are different. Um, the, the needs of, of many migrants. So I think it's, I do think it's important to recognize them. I, I guess I would, I'd actually push back a little bit from Jennifer's point about how a person can move from a migrant to a refugee to a, generally it's not the case. I mean, you, usually you're a refugee or you're not a refugee, unless it's a refugee surplus kind of a situation where the, the, the situation in your country has changed. Um, but that said, clearly, we need to, I mean, the bottom line is that people's basic human rights need to be protected. Um, for people who don't meet the refugee definition uh, and who can't go back, and I think this is one of the aspirations certainly of the Global Compact on Migration, but also for the Refugee Compact, uh, is that there are other forms of protection that, be, that are created, that are out there. There are models out there of temporary protection, complementary protection, um, even for people who are not refugees. Um, and the Global Compact on Migration perhaps more so than the Global Compact on Refugees, um, in terms of how it's being drafted now, but the Refugee Compact as well, provide opportunities um, to, to move that ball forward, I think, overall. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think, I don't know if I would yeah, agree that having separate processes creates more problems because we have, we do have populations that have different needs and a lot of the similar needs, I would say. 
And just in that, I mean, it's, it feels like it's just the age old question. Um, and it's manipulated by states all the time. I mean, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> I don't know that, I actually, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a bit of a bit, I don't know whether one document would have been better for all or worse for all or better for one than the other. Uh, was certainly the intention originally, and then, I mean, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just because states couldn't figure out the definition, it's because there's a lot of politics <laughs> involved in who's going to be recognized as a refugee and who isn't, and those are domestic politics oftentimes. I mean, obviously there's a, an incredibly uh, toxic rhetoric on <coughs> migrants in particular, but also on refugees now in a lot of countries that has always been around, but is really percolating to the top and being used for political purposes domestically, um, really what are foreign, foreign, oftentimes foreign uh, policy issues. So I guess I don't, I personally don't spend too much time there because like in that sort of what would be better because ultimately there's people who need protection. There's some people who are, obviously there's the vast majority of people of migrants in the world, you know, they don't travel irregularly, that's what we call it in the international Realm. They travel regularly or with, with people, you know, they've gone through the normal process and they haven't been in a situation where they didn't have a choice but to travel in an irregular and a dangerous way. Um, and we always have to remember that, you know, it's a small population we're really talking about when we're talking about migrants who are in vulnerable situations. Um, and I think states need to remember that too. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the end, I, I just see there's an issue of protection and assistance. and. I, do, of course, I mean, I, I was a litigator for a lot of years doing deportation, defense, and asylum. So, I mean, I cling to the law. Like, I cling to the asylum law here, and, you know, and, and uh, so it's important. That it's really important that, a refu that there is refugee law. It's just also a reality that it's applied arbitrarily, unfortunately, regularly. And sometimes in a good way. I mean, states that aren't signatory sometimes, like a Bangladesh, like a Lebanon, like a lot of countries. In fact, many of the countries that are the biggest hosters. You know, they do the right thing, um, and that's good. But ultimately, we want to make sure that you know whether you know it's not at the whim of a state that the, that the rights exist and that they are operationalized in a way that benefits migrants and refugees. Just one point, I think, on the externalization issue, because I think this is a very interesting point. Um, I mean, some people will look at like the Global Compact on Refugees and the emphasis on burden sharing and say, well, you know, why the the North is so interested in this is because they get to throw all their development dollars at the refugee hosting countries in the states, and then the people hopefully won't move. Um, and I think, I'm sure, I imagine, that there is part of that in the calculus. Um, but it's hard at the end of the day to say that, that they shouldn't do that then, right? In terms of, because you're still supporting refugees, and you're, you're making their lives better. The trick is making sure that people still have the right to seek asylum, in a third country. And so once that person shows up on the shores of, of Europe, that they are able to access asylum uh, and that the international legal obligations are upheld. It gets perhaps fuzzier when you're talking about the sharing of law enforcement um, uh, expertise and support to try and block the movement of people. Um, but I think overall, uh, while I realize that some member states might have ulterior motives in terms of supporting uh, the idea of extra support for refugee hosting countries because they want to want to keep them in that region. I think it, it at the end of the day uh, will probably help the lives of those people. And I would just say from a half glass half full perspective that I think it's worthwhile that the member states are talking about these issues because I think there's a, a growing realization, although Andrew would probably might disagree, that the, the 51 refugee deficient definition is insufficient to the realities that we see. That there are protection gaps that need to be filled that the refugee definition just doesn't fill. And I think this is an expression of nations grappling with that. You know, how, because they see so many different types of migrants that have different protection needs, um, but the international legal protection regime doesn't cover them all. So do you open up the refugee, refugee definition? I would argue why not? You know, yeah, okay. The political atmosphere now is not conducive to that. But, you know, just protecting the definition 
so that we don't lose something, I think is the, is the wrong approach over the long term. We need to look at the, the definition and say, can we expand it in some way where we're not going to lose some of it, but that, that we get climate change in there, you know? And, and should we have this, the posture of, no, we can't do that because inevitably it's going to go south? I don't know if that's true until you, until you, until you try. But that's just me, and I might be naive, but I mean, that's the issue. How do you expand the protection regime in a way that member states will accept it? And, and, and there's, there's legal protection for those who really have protection needs but may not be a, a refugee in the 1951 convention. But, so I think it's good that they're talking about it, even though you have you know, member states that might have ulterior motives to water down things, you still got to grapple with the issue. And I think that's what, what they're trying to do. Okay, we're out of time, uh, unless, unless there's an urgent question. Thank you all for coming. We have the uh, collection in the back. It's also on our website, um, and more to come.